All right, so we're going to finish up digestive tract today. And when we left off on Monday, we were talking about uh, the mucosal membrane, which is the surface of the stomach, and it contains millions of these things called gastric pits that are lined with a variety of different types of cells making up that <clears throat> making up that pit. And in fact, we find three different types of cells that line that gland. <clears throat> which is right where I think I left off. Okay, so three cell types lined the gland. And I actually have a single gland here that we've kind of blown up to illustrate the different types of cells that uh, line the gland. And, and really there's more than just three, but there are three that are most important. So what, did we really, like on mucosal membrane, I didn't put contains millions of small pits. Yeah, yeah, the gastric that. pit leads to gastric gland. Produce produce cocktail protein digesting enzymes. Yes. So this goes right under there. Okay. Three types of cells. So this guy here, which is produce cocktail protein digesting enzymes. Are you good now? Yes, sir. Thank you. So three types of cells line the gland. And really, it's more than three, but three that are going to be pretty important here. You're going to have one type of cell that's an acid secreting cell and these acid secreting cells uh, yeah. also known as parietal cells are going to be cells that generate hydrochloric acid which is a very strong acid um, in the stomach it's referred also to as gastric acid and this is actually what's going to decrease pH to allow denaturing of proteins to allow better enzymatic digestion of those proteins we're also going to have a group of cells called mucus producing cells or secreting cells. And these mucus secreting cells, as you should probably guess from their name, are going to secrete mucus. And so that mucus is going to be pushed out with the gastric juice and it will begin to line over the tissue of the stomach. And this is actually going to be a protective lining over the tissue of the stomach. So when that acid gets released out of the uh, out of the gastric gland into the lumen of the stomach, it's not going to break down the proteins that are inherently supposed to be there because they're your proteins that make up your cells in your stomach. It gives a layer of protection. And then the last cell type that I want you to know about, uh, on this figure they refer to these as the chief cells. I'm going to actually refer to them by what they produce, which is this hormone here called pepsinogen, or this enzyme, I should say, pepsinogen. So this is going to be a pepsinogen secreting cell. Hydrochloric acid, when it's released, denatures the protein. Mucus prevents that hydrochloric acid from affecting the other cells in the stomach that are supposed to be there. And then pepsinogen is going to act as a protein digesting enzyme. Pepsinogen is a precursor to pepsin, which is the protein digesting enzyme specifically. Okay, so the protein digesting enzyme. So you mix all of these different secretions together, including some others, and, and really these G cells and these D cells, they're really just endocrine cells. The D cells produce somatostatin. Somatostatin is uh, what we would find in the pancreas as well that helps to regulate both insulin and glucagon and then also 
um, and find some somatostatin release in, in the brain. And then we have this really interesting hormone called gastrin. And gastrin produced from the G cells is going to help out not only with the stimulation of acid, but gastrin is also going to help out with the sensations of being full or being, being hungry. So it interacts with the central nervous system as well. So collectively, all of these secretions mix together into a cocktail that's known as gastric juice. So this gastric juice is going to be released from the gastric pits into the lumen of the stomach. And as it's released into the lumen of the stomach, the food that you consume is going to be mixed with the gastric juice, and in particular the acid and the enzyme components. Acids and enzymes. So uh, let's consider um, let's consider a hamburger. A hamburger is made up of basically muscle tissue from beef cattle. And that means that you're going to have things like actin and myosin loaded up in the in the tissue, cell membrane called a sarcolemma. All of that stuff is going to be present. And you're going to use your teeth to begin to chew that food up and begin to break it down mechanically, mixing it with some salivary amylase, which really isn't going to have much of an effect here because it's animal product rather than a potato or some other starchy food. Uh, and then it gets delivered as a meal bolus into the stomach. That food gets chomped up and churned in the mechanics of the stomach, mixing it with gastric juice. Those enzymes and those acids begin to interact with the proteins. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about proteins, I'm talking about actin and myosin from that muscle tissue, but I'm also talking about the receptors that are bound up in the membrane and the free enzymes that are floating around in the cell. I'm talking about anything that is a protein made up of amino acids is going to begin to be broken apart and broken down. So protein and then also the connective tissue. broken down. Now, as the protein and the connective tissue are broken down mechanically and then enzymatically or chemically, we are going to end up with individual amino acids or at most a sequence uh, or a, a chain of amino acids, no more than three amino acids. In length. Okay, so maybe there's some um, insulin present in that beef and that's about 176 uh, amino acids, and it gets broken up into individual amino acids, two amino acid chain or three amino acid chain, breaking all of, the, all of the chain apart. Those amino acids, when they're broken up, we refer to them as <coughs> residues. And we say that they are liberated because they are set free from their amino acid chain or protein. Now, along with the other macronutrients, carbohydrates, starch, and uh, other carbohydrates being chopped up and broken down, we're going to be left over with a solution in the stomach called chyme. And this is what's going to be delivered into the small intestine. Now, this solution called chyme is what's actually going to be regulated through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. And this is going to be released in small boluses or small lumps. So chyme is delivered to the small intestine, and it's going to be regulated regulated by the pyloric sphincter. And 
which is just simply a smooth muscle ring. A smooth muscle ring that is going to open and close when we need to deliver some of this kind into the small intestine. And so in one sense, this pyloric sphincter acts as a drawstring. The kind of stuff sack for a sleeping bag and maintains the closure and helps the closure to be closed or to be open. Now, before we leave the stomach and enter into the small intestine, I just want to go back real quick and re ask the question Do we digest our stomach? If we can digest a hamburger, which is made up of cells, and our stomach is made up of cells, do we digest our stomach? And this would be really problematic. You probably are already thinking, no, we don't. But we got to make sure we understand the physiological reasons. And the reason that it would be problematic is because our stomach is made up of cells, because it's a tissue. It contains tissues, and it's an organ. So those cells contain proteins. And the inherent proteins that are supposed to be there, they're going to denature in the presence of acid. They would be exposed to pepsinogen and pepsin and be broken down just like the hamburger that you can see. So certainly since there are proteins that are present and because gastric juice digests proteins, it seems like we have the ingredients for a perfect storm that we'd be constantly digesting our stomach. And so it's possible that we do and that we regenerate it. That would be so energetically demanding. We'd have to regenerate millions and millions of cells almost constantly. So as we already have alluded to, the stomach is going to be lined with mucus. Mucus is secreted and when that mucosal lining is intact over the mucosal wall, the luminal wall of the stomach, it protects these cells of the stomach that are supposed to be there. Occasionally this mucosal wall can be damaged. And there's a variety of different things that could damage this. Some pharmaceutical use can damage the mucosal wall. Stress can damage the mucosal wall and make the, the wall less integral. Uh, there's a bunch of different things that could happen. And whenever it's damaged, that means then the stomach is no longer protected. Those cells are no longer protected, and they do begin to digest. And as those cells digest, we form what's called a peptic ulcer. And because of the uh, tissue that is now being degraded eventually leads to the submucosa, where we have our vessels and our supply, we can begin to bleed into the stomach uh, if that ulcer gets uh, bad enough. And so you can actually detect components of the blood called porphy uh, porphyrias in the, um, uh, in the fecal material if you are, um, if you do have a, a, some type of ulcer. Uh, so the biggest thing to do here is to repair or allow the body to repair that mucosal lining and that will begin to allow that process to stop and then the ulcer to degrade and go back through here. All right, so stomach is a storage site. It's also a site of digestion and breakdown of the foodstuffs that you've consumed. And then the stomach, through the pyloric sphincter, regulates release of this solution called chyme into the small intestine. And once we get into the small intestine, we're going to find out that there are two major functions. The 
his two major functions are going to include digestion. In fact, the small intestine <laughs> is the main organ or one of the main organs of digestion. And whenever you hear the term digestion, you should be thinking breakdown of foodstuffs, breakdown of the material that you have consumed. Now, most of what happens here is going to actually be more chemical digestion rather than mechanical digestion. But we'll see more protein broken down. We'll begin to see <coughs> carbohydrates and lipids. And then we have the additional, to facilitate the digestion, we have additional enzymes that are released from the cells of the small intestine and then also from the pancreas. So additional enzymes mixed with the chyme. We're going to have uh, pancreatic amylase, which will help to digest the, any starch materials. We're going to have additional um, protein digesting enzymes, both chymo, uh, chymotrypsin and trypsin will be deposited into the small intestine to start breaking up those, those uh, proteins that are present. What is that called? Additional enzymes enter? Enter from the small intestine and from the pancreas. So the cells of the small intestine can produce enzymes and release them. We're also going to have pancreatic enzymes that are generated and that are released into the common bile ducts and deposited into the small intestine. Also bicarbonate to neutralize the acids because we no longer have an intact mucosal lining once we enter the small intestine. It's not protected the same way that the stomach is. So digestion is a, an important function of the small intestine. And the small intestine is also going to be our main point of nutrient absorption. So our main point of nutrient absorption. Now, in order for absorption to occur, we have to have our nutrients in the absolute smallest structure possible. Right? So you all are aware that our macromolecules, which is a term that we're going to use to describe Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, or uh, polynucleic, um, polynucleotides, I should say, RNAs, DNAs, they have to be broken down into their individual components. So proteins <coughs> and amino acids, carbohydrate chains down to individual monomers of, uh, of, of glucose monosaccharides, so polysaccharides to monosaccharides, uh, nucleic acids from the polynucleotides to individual nucleotides, and for lipids, Really, it just has to break apart lipid, mem most, well, mostly we're talking about membranes when we're, when we're thinking about lipids. We just have to break those lipids apart. We're not really taking an individual lipid molecule and breaking it down further. An individual lipid molecule is the small, smallest component. And that's still a really big molecule. So we're going to have to do something special with our lipids. So our macromolecules, we have to go from their poly form, their polymer form, to their monomer form. So from the chains to the individual component molecules. And the reason that we need to do this is because we need them to be small enough to travel to the bloodstream. So to cross the lining the cells, lining the lumen of the small intestine and across the capillary, uh, the capillary cells, we need our molecules to be really small in order to facilitate that process. No, sorry. So in the small intestine, about 90% of all nutrients are going to be absorbed. 90% of absorption occurs here. Now the small intestine is an organ with multiple parts. And 
And we're going to define those parts as anatomic regions or anatomical regions. And there's going to be three that are distinct. Interestingly enough, though, it's not necessarily the anatomy. I mean, positionally, yes. We're going to see that well, the first 10 to 12 inches is a uh, part of the uh, small intestine we call the duodenum. And then the remaining 10 feet would be the uh, jejunum and the ilium. Really, the anatomical regions are defined more properly based on their changes in function. So the three anatomical regions are going to vary in function. So the duodenum, which is about the first 10 inches from the pyloric sphincter, about 10 inches away, contains the opening to the common bile duct. This is primarily a digestion zone. So primarily digestion. And what that means is proteins are further being further broken down, carbohydrates being further broken down, but nothing's really being absorbed. So let me ask you a question. Let's see if we're beginning to think like physiologists yet. What should the luminal wall look like? What's that? No, nope, it's not going to have mucus lining. We're actually, we're not going to continue that mucus lining from the from the stomach. What I thought I heard you say was it was going to be smooth. Is that what you said? So it's going it's to be more smooth. In other words, we're not going to have a high concentration of villi and microvilli. We're not going to have huge amounts of surface area because we just don't need it because we're not using this portion of the digestive system for absorption. So primarily digestion, low, lower amounts of surface area. And then as we move into the jejunum and the ileum, <clears throat> which are about the last 10 feet or so of the small intestine, we're going to increase in the number of villi and microvilli that are present. Let me try to make this a little bit bigger here, just for a second. <coughs> so you can see that the wall is going to be much more velvety because of those villi. <clears throat> and, and this is an individual villi here. And if you can see it, there's small little microvilli for each of these membranes uh, from the cell. So the cell membrane also has microvilli. <clears throat> and then the cells are folded up and invaginated into villi. All right? And then you can see that you have blood supply and you have lymphatic supply in each of the villi. So this is a massive amount of surface area <clears throat> and the luminal wall changes greatly in appearance as we transition from the duodenum into the jejunum and continues into the ileum. So these two portions of the small intestine are going to be heavily involved in absorption. This is very apparent because of the increased number of microscopic Folds? 10 feet. Increased number of microscopic folds in that mucosa for those two portions of the small intestine. <clears throat> Villi is the term that's used to reference to the, the bigger foldings. And again, just by having villi, we increase the surface area. We also, in the same amount of distance, so if I draw a line here, this is distance, and let's say that it's one nanometer in length. And if it's flat, I might be able to get one cell. Over that same nanometer, 
if I add in a villi, I might be able to triple or quadruple the number of cells that I can get in. <coughs> So they don't increase like the length. They use the width for the No, well, um, they're foldings, and so it's it's it actually. If you were to grab on, so if I pulled up the paper here, this would represent the villi. And so if I were to grab the villi and I were to pull it out, it would be a lot longer. So this distance here to here, if I were to straighten that out. In the same distance here, the distance is going to be more along the lines of like that. Does that make sense? And then you can fit in more of those cells. And because you can fit in more of the cells, you can have more of the microvilli, which are the same type of folding, only in the cell membrane rather than in the whole tissue. So increase the surface area with our villi, and then we have a lot more cells, and those cells also have tiny or small folds in their me membrane surface that faces out into the lumen of the small intestine. So we refer to those as the microvilli. So the villi is the tissue level. The microvilli means little villi is the cell membrane level. And now we're going to have an even bigger increase or a further increase in surface area. Now, because of the villi and the microvilli, microscopic observation of the mucosa in the jejunum and in the ileum it, that surface takes on a very velvety appearance. So you think about a velvet rope that they may have in a museum or something like that. The inside, the luminal wall of jejunum and duodena, or of ilium, have a very velvety appearance, a very velvety consistency. That velvety consistency is called the brush. brush border. Okay, let me get in. This is going to be D. D would go right underneath the C here. Just before I move on, I want to kind of illustrate what the effects are of the folds and the villi and the microvilli that we find in the jejunum and the ileum, we know that it increases surface area. If you could take a guess, by how much? So increase the surface area compared to the duodenum by how much? Five hundred times. You would have just probably won the prices right if you were. Did you said five hundred sixty-two, right? Yeah? Oh, 567. There you go. 500 times. There you go. It is a lot. And so it's basically like taking one inch and making it 500 inches. 500 inches is pretty long distance. Quarter mile? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking feet, 500 feet, 500 inches. What is that, 30 feet maybe? Yeah. How much of that do you have to have? Because like people get some of their injuries on their feet. But how much of your stomach is actually? That's a really good question. I've never really thought about that. Huh. All of it. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I mean, you'd want to... Uh, I guess you really need to change your diet. And there are probably certain types of foods like solutions and things like that that you can drink that are going to absorb heat more easily. Good question. I don't know. If you really want to impress me, you'll come back with an answer on Monday. You don't have to, though. I know you're real busy. She can't, you know, it's just like, dang it. <laughs> I don't want to answer any, ask any questions anymore. Okay, so if the ileum and the jejunum are the main points of nutrient absorption, um, how do we actually absorb nutrients? And the answer is that to absorb nutrients is going to depend on the nutrient. So nutrient dependent, we'll just kind of take these in turn and we'll start out with proteins. Okay, so what you're looking at here, you've got capillary blood supply at the bottom, and then you have the intestinal lumen here at the top, and then these would be mucosal cells that make up that make up the uh, the small intestine. So capillary is going to be contained within that submucosal tissue layer. So here's an example of a really really long protein. That protein is too long to be able to cross through into the blood supply. So proteins first have to be broken down. And again, we're doing that with increasing acid, increasing the pH, and the, which denatures the protein, and then adding in enzymes that when the, peat, when the protein is in its linear form, those um, enzymes, chymotrypsin and trypsin and even carboxypeptidase is going to cleave certain amino acids or between certain amino acids breaking apart their um, peptide bond. Okay, and then eventually we're going to have a small pool of individual amino acids. Now this figure shows that we have individual amino acids, amino acids that are just a single amino acid not bound up with other amino acids through a peptide chain. I've actually recently read some uh, new information that we can get away with as big as three individual amino acids still covalently bonded together and move them across into the uh, intestinal mucosal cell and then into the, into the bloodstream. But a large protein like insulin has to be broken up to it to much much smaller components. So we're gonna break down the protein into individual amino acids. I'm gonna just abbreviate that as AA. So that's amino acid. And from the small intestine, those individual amino acids are going to be taken into the mucosal cells. Now, to be brought into the mucosal cells, we actually have to use active transport. So it's not just crossing through the membrane. Most peptides or proteins are going to be, uh, they're going to be um, hydrophobic, no, I'm sorry, hydrophilic, and so they're going to be lipid focused. They're going to not really play well with lipids. There are some amino acids that are more lipophilic and can just cross through, but most of them are lipophobic, and so they're not just going to be able to easily move through the membrane. So we're going to have to have a transport mechanism. It's typically an active transport mechanism. Um, in your mind, you should kind of be thinking about a protein that gets inserted into the membrane, grabs onto the amino acid when the amino acid is when it grabs onto that amino acid, it gets inverted into into the cell.
Once in the mucosal cells, so once we have our amino acids inside of the mucosal cells, we have to move them into the extracellular fluid. So we have to move them into that interstitial space. They move through that basal cellular wall, mucosal cell wall, through facilitated diffusion. So through facilitated diffusion. And then from there, once in the inner the uh, extracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid, we'll move into the bloodstream via diffusion. So the capillaries are actually going to be a little more permeable. It's, uh, based off of size than the mucosal wall membrane. And so diffusion is going to be a possibility. So we're going to have those intracellular clefts that will allow those individual amino acids or amino acids up to two or three peptides in length to cross into the bloodstream. So that's a basic rundown, pretty simple, straightforward, not a lot of uh, biology uh, uh, expectation here. Just kind of know the basic mechanism of transport to move the amino acid from intestinal lumen into the bloodstream. Now, I do want to take one second here, and it's going to be more than one second. Uh, we still got about nine minutes. So let me talk just a little bit about recombinant growth, bovine growth hormone. Have any of you heard of recombinant bovine growth hormone before? Yeah, it's actually illegal in the state of Georgia to give your cows recombinant uh, uh, bovine growth hormone, which would stimulate milk production. Uh, and the reason that is is because people were afraid that having recombinant bovine growth hormone used, that it was going to cause some sort of issues in humans that consume the milk. Okay. Um, it amazes me that that was a law that was passed in the state of Georgia, and it makes me think that politicians in Georgia are very scientifically naive. And you're going to see why here in just a second. So it's a growth hormone. It's a hormone, which means it has to be in its complete structure to have some sort of effect. Okay. It is a peptide hormone or a protein hormone. So if I were to consume bovine growth hormone, let's say, in a glass of milk, the original proposal was that that hormone would cross into the bloodstream and it would interact with my growth hormone receptors and would cause me to have growth potentially leading to cancer, something along those lines. It was going to cause some sort of disease or adverse problem. It's a protein. It's a proteinaceous hormone. So what's the problem with that idea? How is this, how is this going to get digested? Once I consume it into my, in through my mouth, down into the digestive system, it's going to have to go through the stomach, and it's going to have to go through the duodenum. By the time it gets into the stomach and the duodenum, it's going to be exposed to a high level of acids. It's going to be exposed to uh, peptide and protein degrading enzymes, and I'm going to break it up into individual amino acids. The amino acids that are present in bovine growth hormone are the same amino acids that you're going to find in all of the other sources of protein that you consume, both from animal and from plant food sources. In other words, by having bo bovine growth hormone present in the milk, it's just going to supply me with essential amino acids that I need in my diet. I don't really understand why it became such a big deal. It's, it's a huge topic all over the country. Um, and in a lot of places, bovine growth hormone, you can go to the store. It, you'll, you'll see on Georgia milk, it says uh, no R -O -R -B -S -T. Another name for growth hormone, somatostat. It's a no recombinant bovine somatostat. Maybe you've seen that on 
a container of milk here in the state of Georgia. That's to get rid of, prevent farmers from putting bovine growth hormone in. So the process of putting bovine growth hormone in, it, it yields a much higher level of milk production, which means milk costs go down. Milk is going to be actually cheaper. Right now, the cheapest milk in the state of Georgia is about 250 a gallon. Places where you can buy growth hormone that's produced, or uh, milk that's produced from growth hormone can be under two bucks a gallon. So if you buy a gallon a week, you can do the math and you can see you're saving 300 bucks on your grocery bill every year. Anyways, um, so bovine growth hormone no longer used. The way that farmers, it, it was really labor intensive. Farmers had to inject each of their individual cattle. They had to inject directly in the bloodstream because they couldn't just give it to them orally because they just digest it and become amino acids and would never have any sort of effect. So what's the problem? Did they just not research it? The problem, it the problem is ignorant, stupid people. Yeah. Which is one of the main problems we have in the United <laughs> States anyways. Yeah, it's people who don't, who, who never really took the time to understand a simple concept of digesting proteins that I just covered in five minutes and you're all now basically experts on it. So you hopefully can see things like this and say, uh, that's not really <laughs> physiologically accurate. Is that the same with every growth hormone or just that? Oh, every growth hormone because they're all, they're all protein peptide hormones. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, everybody makes five. I mean, that's pregnant in a lot the, of the, the, the bigger concern for me is antibiotic use in, in farm animals. There's some real important stuff with, with, uh, um, with antibiotic use. And, and I think we need to probably move away from using antibiotics or figure out better ways to use antibiotics. <laughs> Is there any other adverse effect to eating? Is there any other adverse effect to eating? So, like, whenever we don't want to eat meat, has hormones in it. Mm -hmm. We're like, it yeah, for the most part, there are. I mean, I, we should remember from endocrinology at the beginning of the semester, there are some hormones that are not that fast. So we can give testosterone or estrogen to chickens and egg uh, chickens and, and beef cattle and things like that, um, maybe to try to boost egg production, and it may be problematic. There may be too much, too many estrogens in, in in those cases, but that's not common practice. Farmers aren't doing that. Farmers were putting in bovine growth hormone to decrease milk costs, and I mean, you look at costs now, and they're they're much much higher than they were 20 years ago, even assuming in, in calculating the inflation. Okay, so. Are we out of time? No, not quite yet. Uh, the second macronutrient, carbohydrates. So again, uh, here's our luminal side or apical side of, uh, of uh, mucosal cells. So carbohydrates are going to collect up in here. We have on our basal lateral side, our basal membrane, we're going to have uh, the uh, interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. And then we have our blood supply or blood stream. So when you consume carbohydrates, whether it's from a potato or from a hamburger, most of the time, those carbohydrates, majority of them are going to be polysaccharides, which is the polymer of carbohydrates. So those polysaccharides enter the oral cavity. And as you chew up the food, you're producing saliva, and that food is mixed with salivary amylase. Salivary amylase. And initially, the polysaccharide is going to be broken up into 
disaccharides. So individual, or uh, uh, I should say, um, carbohydrates with two individual monomers. The most common disaccharide is sucrose, which is a glucose monomer and a fructose monomer. So really, by the time we begin to dump the meal into the small intestine, our disaccharides are what are going to be primarily present. So from polysaccharides to disaccharides, that's what enters into the small intestine. In the small intestine, we mix in a second amylase from a pancreatic source. This pancreatic amylase is delivered to the small intestine. And those disaccharides, when exposed to pancreatic amylase, are broken into monosaccharides. For example, individual glucose molecules. Now, glucose, again, we're going to use that as our primary starting point for energy production. We take it through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain to generate ATP. So this is going to be one of our most usable forms of carbohydrates, is to get it down to the level of glucose. Fructose, which is an uh, which is an isomer of glucose, can actually enter into the Krebs cycle or enter the glycolysis from a slightly different enzymatic pathway. But none the same. We need fructose or glucose, which are individual monosaccharides. Let me give me uh, just 13 more seconds here. This should look really similar because the individual monosaccharides are going to follow very similar mecha mechanisms to amino acids. We have an active transport mechanism that supports sodium and glucose transport into the cell. And then we have a facilitated diffusion mechanism where I am generating ATP through my ATPase, sodium potassium pump, moving two potassium in, three sodium out to, to uh, catalyze an ATP molecule. The facilitated uh, portion here is to use the GLUT2 transport protein to deposit glucose into, really it goes into here first and then diffuses through the larger openings in the blood capillary. All right, have a nice weekend. We'll finish up with lipids on Monday and then we'll begin reproductive system.